indeed, Richard. I uh, haven't often been the gap between the lampposts, but I'm glad to be the gap between the lampposts this evening. Uh, standard forms of contract uh, developed, as uh, people will know, uh, they won't remember, I hope, uh, when industrialisation meant that there had to be a lot more uh, standard forms created uh, because building contracts started their life out uh, as being uh, an add-on to the Chancery Bar who produced complex leases and gradually they started producing uh, forms of contract. So it was in the 1800s that standard forms uh, came to the fore and two things happened was there came a standardisation uh, of the clauses uh, and also uh, the concept that you needed a person, an architect or an engineer uh, to be the appropriate person to have an administrative role in the contract was born. And so we now live uh, and have our being, by and large, with standard forms of contract uh, and with uh, the concept of the architect and engineer. Uh, from the early days, uh, standard forms of contract uh, spread abroad uh, because uh, obviously uh, we had an empire at one stage, uh, but also uh, uh, British entrepreneurs, and they weren't just Scottish, a lot of them were Scottish, but British entrepreneurs uh, went around the world. And an 1860 uh, case of Sharp and Sao Paulo Railway Company uh, a decree by the Emperor of Brazil uh, led to uh, Sharp and Sons uh, building a railway in Brazil. Uh, for a sum at that stage, the contract sum was £1.85 million, pounds, which in 1860 uh, was probably one of the large infrastructure projects. And that was under an English standard form of contract. And when the dispute uh, broke out, uh, guess what the uh, topic was, it was, uh, is the engineer's certificate a condition precedent to payment, even if the engineer has orally said he would pay more, uh, and were you entitled to go to court, or had you got to go to arbitration in order to have a new certificate from the arbitrator. So one can see from early days there's been an international spread of English uh, and British standard forms of contract. The RIBA form, uh, which some of us still call the RIBA form, judges, uh, it seems, have a habit of uh, always calling them the RIBA forms, started in the 1870s and, of course, are now well known as they transferred across to be the JCT standard form of uh, building contract. Those forms, as most people know, are used very little abroad. Uh, the standard engineering forms are the ones which are much more common. Uh, and in particular, uh, the uh, civil engineering contracts, for instance the ICE conditions, uh, started in 1930, uh, and it wasn't long before the model of the FIDIC uh, came out but that was in the 1950s. And I think if you go around uh, the world these days, although we have the rainbow suite of FIDIC, you will find uh, in many countries there is the uh, fourth edition of FIDIC still being used uh, because it is a form which is known and loved and in various parts has actually been incorporated as the national uh, standard form of contract. Now in this lecture uh, I want to consider uh, how UK standard forms uh, obviously developed in the culture of the UK and English law principles and how those have uh, or can be applied uh, when you have a different cultural and legal system. Uh, and I'll look at a number of aspects uh, of those forms. And obviously this is an appropriate subject uh, for a Povey lecture, uh, Philip being a barrister who for 50 years 
starting with the uh, NFBTE, uh, which some of you will recall, uh, and ending up then as the Secretary General of the JCT and having a large role in uh, drafting standard forms, he obviously uh, had in mind uh, the importance of standard form provisions and how they apply. Let's look first at the position of the engineer or the architect. Uh, everybody would accept that on a construction contract, the obligations in terms of money and time and work are extremely flexible, and you need somebody there to administer it. Uh, the model obviously developed uh, that it was the owner's engineer or architect, very often employed by the owner, or in the case of Mr. Brunel, uh, both uh, the owner himself and the promoter and the engineer on his own contracts. In those days, there wasn't anything uh, called conflict of interest, uh, which bothered people. Uh, but nowadays, uh, obviously, uh, the standard forms are quite complex and they have a, a series of rights uh, and obligations which are dealt with uh, by the architect or the engineer. I mean, you start obviously with the provision of drawings, details and instructions. There's extensions of time, issuing practical completion certificates, uh, delivering lists of defects uh, and giving consent to subletting. Uh, issuing variations, you then have the interim and final certification uh, process and under the JCT such things as ascertaining loss and expense or under the ICE conditions uh, producing cost. Now in exercising those as we know there is a dual role. There is the role of the agent who is acting purely on the instruction of the client and there is the role which is somewhat different. Uh, and I think one uh, finds, obviously, in Sutcliffe and Thackeray, the wonderful uh, way in which the English courts uh, could look at an agent who had a duty not just to obey the uh, instructions of the client, but also uh, as was said in that case, which was under the RIBA conditions, uh, the architect uh, had a duty to act fairly uh, in those uh, words of Lord Reed, holding the balance between the client and the contractor. Now I think those of you uh, who have experience of working abroad uh, will know that uh, a lot of uh, overseas clients have no difficulty with the concept of the engineer uh, complying with the instructions of the client, uh, but they do find difficulty uh, with the independent engineer uh, certifying uh, and holding the balance uh, between the employer who employs them as their agent uh, and the contractor. Uh, and that cultural model, one might think, is purely uh, a part of, of English law which has developed in a slightly esoteric manner in the way uh, English law does. And of course we look uh, in the common law system uh, to the way in which the judges have interpreted uh, the law uh, increasingly, of course, we have statutory law which applies, uh, but unlike all the civil law jurisdictions, uh, we don't have an overriding code uh, which codifies the law. <coughs> now, in, when you then uh, move into a civil uh, code uh, jurisdiction, uh, then uh, the whole basis of construction law has to be within the uh, terms of the code. Uh, and the civil code, for instance, in the UAE, uh, treats construction contracts 
uh, as part of the mukawala, uh, uh, that is contracts to make things or provide services. And therefore it is a very general application of legal uh, principles. Uh, but the one uh, difference we have between our system uh, and uh, systems elsewhere is that uh, question of good faith. Uh, now, this is not a lecture uh, in which I am going to develop uh, the question of whether good faith is applicable uh, in common law systems or the extent to which it is. Uh, but I think you have to look, when you're uh, overseas, not at decisions which have been made by English courts, but at the way in which you interpret a contract uh, having uh, in mind provisions of the civil code. Now, most civil law jurisdictions uh, have uh, a dual uh, part to the civil code. Uh, the first is that agreements which are lawfully entered into take the place of the law for those who have made them. So in other words, it's often said that the contract between the parties is the law of the parties. Uh, and that is therefore their own codified law. Uh, but you also have the second point, which is the obligations under the contract must be performed in good faith. Now, uh, we know that there are various um, contract, standard forms of contract, the NEC, for instance, and some of what uh, uh, fellow judges might call the more touchy-feely uh, forms of contract, uh, which start with some uh, overriding objective in the contract, uh, which uh, starts evidently uh, with uh, everybody agrees to cooperate and act in good faith towards each other uh, and so on. I have to say the experience of, of an English judge is that when you get to uh, the trial bundle, which is normally about 50 uh, volumes long, in <coughs> volume 3, uh, at about page 24, uh, you find a photograph, uh, which is a picture of a lot of people standing round the uh, staircase on the bonding weekend between the parties to the contract, and underneath the charter is signed by all of them in their signature, uh, and you look round uh, at the trial and you read the names of the witnesses and realise not a single one of those people standing by the staircase is still involved in the project. Uh, but the obligation of good faith, therefore, uh, is one which is uh, slowly coming in as an express term, something uh, which is imposed on the parties, uh, but very often I would suggest that in the traditional uh, contracting regime in the UK, it's difficult to apply it. Now, how then does uh, the UAE, or indeed uh, the PRC contract law, all of which have good faith uh, as part of them, uh, how then uh, do they apply these principles of good faith? Uh, the uh, problem is that obviously there is no case law and essentially good faith acts in contracts as a discretionary way in which the courts will apply the uh, provisions of the contract. And so there's no uh, code of good faith. It's an embedded concept uh, of the way in which people uh, perform. Uh, and a court will say, taking into account the facts and circumstances of this case, the obligation of good faith means you have to uh, do this. There are codified uh, parts, for instance, in the UAE code. It, it says uh, a party is prohibited from exercising its rights if it's intended to infringe the rights of another party. Uh, 
the outcome is contrary to the rules of uh, Islamic law, public order or morals, the desired gain is disproportionate to the harm which will be suffered by the other party, or it exceeds the bounds of custom and practice. <coughs> Now, somewhat boldly, I would suggest that in the context of uh, the position of the engineer and the architect, uh, the imposition of a, an obligation of good faith uh, performs much the same role uh, as the House of Lords held in Sutcliffe and Thackeray. In other words, if you are looking at an architect or an engineer who has a certification role and you apply that it's got the parties have agreed that has to be exercised in good faith, that is very much, I would suggest, the same as holding the balance between the parties. The route is different, but I would suggest that although the whole framework of uh, the legal obligations is different, uh, the obligation of good faith uh, comes in uh, and takes its place. So that it may well be that where you express, as the House of Lords did, the obligation of the architect to act fairly, that is really saying, uh, that is holding the balance between the parties, uh, that is as close as one gets uh, to interpretation of the parties agreeing that the contract will be performed in good faith. Now the second part of it is of course the way in which we construe contracts uh, in uh, England and Wales. Uh, and uh, whenever I come to do a new edition of Keating, uh, there is yet another decision, of course, in, to start with the House of Lords, now of the Supreme Court, which tells us uh, how we uh, construe contracts, the degree to which background matters can be taken into account, and the degree to which they can't be. Uh, and uh, that, uh, obviously, is a very uh, English common law uh, principle. Uh, and uh, in uh, a civil law uh, system, uh, when one comes to uh, construe a contract, and indeed in certain common law countries, uh, such as New Zealand, you can look at conduct following the entering into of the contract. That is a complete no-no, uh, even, uh, I think, today. Uh, I hesitate in case the Supreme Court has just changed it within the past few hours. Uh, but uh, it is still a principle that you can't look uh, at uh, evidence of what happened after the contract to construe the terms of the contract. Now, in a lot of uh, jurisdictions, uh, it's entirely uh, acceptable and indeed is seen as one of the most important uh, parts uh, of the uh, construction. And it goes back to some extent uh, to the obligation of good faith because you accept that when parties start performing the contract, they are performing the obligations in good faith. And therefore, until a dispute arises, when, as we know, uh, parties polarise each uh, their positions, uh, in uh, most civil law jurisdictions, and I would suggest probably in 20 years in a lot of common law jurisdictions, we will take account of what has happened in the performance of the contract. Obviously, we have um, various devices by which we try to bypass it. Uh, and, uh, for instance, we use waiver and we use estoppel. Uh, but uh, uh, I know from making submissions in court that we don't rely on evidence which happened after the construction, uh, after the entering into the contract. And one is left always with that submission 
that the court may find it of some interest, but obviously is completely inadmissible in construing the contract, that the parties, when they were conducting themselves for the first four months of this project, acted precisely as I submit the court should construe it. Uh, and uh, that is a submission which is often made. So the first thing is matters of construction are different in a civil law jurisdiction, and therefore the background and the material which you consider when a dispute arises is different. The second thing is, uh, it is always amazing when you read a pleading by a barrister under a standard form of contract, uh, that you find there are implied terms uh, which are not incorporated within the contract. Uh, and uh, as we know, the uh, classic implied terms which are there are, are uh, the implied terms that the owner will cooperate to do all things necessary to allow the contractor to perform the contract, and the corollary of that is that the owner, employer, will not hinder or prevent the contractor in the performance of the contract. Equally, uh, the rather more mundane uh, implied terms are normally that the contractor will use, uh, uh, carry out the work in a good and workmanlike manner and use good and proper materials. It is surprising uh, that those implied terms, despite uh, all of the standard forms we have are still in most cases necessary uh, to fill in the gaps in the express terms of the standard forms. Now in civil law uh, jurisdictions, of course, uh, there aren't implied terms of that sort. There are, of course, uh, provisions of the civil code uh, which give rise to obligations and again, uh, that obligation of good faith. Uh, and I think for those of you who, like me, have had experience uh, of pleading cases uh, before civil law uh, arbitrators uh, in uh, the Middle East and Africa, uh, one finds uh, that in the end, uh, the good faith obligation, uh, if you're construing a contract and there is an obligation of good faith, then it leads essentially to uh, the same employer's terms. If you are performing a contract in good faith as against the other party, you have to cooperate to do everything necessary to allow that party to perform and you can't hinder or prevent that other party. And therefore, uh, from that point of view, I think one can say uh, that although the route is entirely different, uh, not judge-made law, uh, within most of the civil code jurisdictions, implied terms uh, of the standard type, which are not in the standard forms, uh, are likely to be uh, imposed. Now, the next aspect is uh, one of the favourites, of course, of construction uh, contracts is the question of notice. Uh, we have uh, a series of attempts uh, to have notice provisions in contracts which make a party's uh, rights uh, subject uh, to a notice. A and one of the... Uh, uh, problems we, we have always is that the common lawyer uh, doesn't really like uh, a notice preventing a party uh, from having the rights it might have under the contract. Uh, I am sure that uh, most uh, lawyers here have acted for contractors at any stage or uh, those of you who are contractors uh, will know that uh, very often the notice provisions have not entirely been complied with uh, by the time you come to advise uh, and you find therefore uh, that there has to be some way uh, 
uh, of overcoming the notice provisions. The first question, of course, is whether the notice is a condition precedent. Uh, and uh, some of you may remember the uh, case uh, in which Mr Justice Jackson as he then was in Multiplex and Honeywell uh, where there was a condition precedent uh, that all necessary notices and all necessary supporting information had to be provided within very time, uh, close time limits uh, and uh, the information consisted of uh, cause and effect programmes all labour, plant uh, and material records, all schedules for delivery of those, a CPA analysis uh, of delay uh, and all sorts of other documents which had to be produced within, uh, I think, 14 days. And in the event of failure to do so, uh, the party waived all rights under the contract, at common law, in equity, under statute, for any uh, recompense uh, under the contract. Now that obviously is a very uh, tight uh, and some would say unfair clause. Now, Mr Justice Jackson uh, expressed the view that notice provisions uh, requiring pro prompt notice uh, serve a valuable purpose because it enables the matters to be dealt with at the time and notice gives the employer the opportunity uh, to withdraw instructions or, or to uh, alter a course to avoid uh, dramatic financial consequences. Uh, the uh, notice provisions vary widely under standard forms. Uh, for instance, the ICE conditions notice uh, generally uh, says that if you don't give notice, your entitlement will be limited uh, to uh, the amount of money that can be assessed given the lack of notice or lack of information. Uh, therefore, it sets out the uh, context. Uh, the JCT uh, uses more broad uh, phrases uh, and uses the word uh, provided always that the contractor shall have done various things and in WW Gear uh, that was construed as being a condition precedent. Uh, more recently uh, under the NEC uh, the notice provision of having to notify the project manager uh, of an event uh, that uh, obligation certainly in the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal, uh, has been held to be uh, much less rigorous because of that little proviso at the end that uh, the contractor doesn't have to notify a compensation event if the uh, project manager should, should have notified it. And experience shows that in about 95% of the cases, uh, the project manager should probably have notified it in the first place. Now, in civil uh, law jurisdictions, uh, obviously, as I've mentioned, uh, the overriding, uh, I won't call it objective, but the overriding way in which you construe a contract is you have to look at the rights and obligations, the agreement uh, makes the uh, law of the parties. Uh, and uh, as uh, one of the provisions of the Code 2433 in, in the UAE says, with regard to the rights and obligations arising out of a contract, each of the contracting parties must perform that which the contract obliges him to do. Uh, and in dealing with uh, contract uh, interpretation, it says if the wording of a contract is clear, it may not be departed from uh, by way of interpretation to in ascertain the intention of the parties. Uh, therefore, in civil jurisdictions, uh, a very uh, strict view is normally taken of uh, notice provisions. You have to comply with them.
I remember a few years ago being the only common law uh, arbitrator uh, on a group with two uh, civil lawyers uh, and uh, a, in order to make a claim under this United Nations contract, notice had to be given within 30 days of an event. And it seemed to me it was probably given a bad day 31. Uh, and uh, I was all for finding some way in which uh, the notice perhaps was confirmed later and the date could be got round. But my uh, civil uh, law colleagues would have none of it uh, and found it much easier to write an award which said that uh, they failed on a time bar uh, basis. Uh, but uh, there is therefore strict compliance. Uh, but uh, obviously, yet again, we come back to the good faith ob obligations. Uh, and those would say that if you have a very strict uh, condition precedent clause, uh, it may be that the party who has specified that and is holding a very rigorous and unfair condition precedent clause uh, would, uh, by, by insisting on that, uh, amount to not acting in good faith. And indeed, there are decisions to that effect. Now, also, there are provisions uh, which say that uh, the exercise of a right, if you have a right, is unlawful if the interest desired are disproportionate to the harm that will be suffered by others. So that, for instance, perhaps if I had known this with my civil lawyers at the time, if one says, well, it's disproportionate uh, to enforce this obligation because the effect of one day late is a party loses a, a right, uh, then under certain provisions in certain civil codes, the uh, court is likely to say that the uh, bar on uh, a right after one day being one day late is disproportionate and it is therefore unlawful uh, to rely on it. So that uh, one can see that although uh, one has uh, the common law, which looks to uh, waiver and, and general fairness, there are provisions uh, in the civil code uh, in many countries uh, which allow uh, recovery. Now, next topic is unforeseen conditions. Now, as Mr. Bottoms found out in 1892, uh, against the York uh, Corporation. Uh, unfortunately, in English law, the contractor takes the risk of unexpected matters arising which are necessary uh, to complete the works. So it, it wasn't long before uh, we found the, what is uh, familiarly known with, to those who uh, practice in the field as a clause 12 coming in to allow uh, a contractor to have uh, a claim for unforeseen conditions. Uh, the premise of that being that if all the risk is on the contractor, they will price high because they will have to price all the risks in, whereas the employer uh, is the person who should really bear the risk rather than having to pay in case the risk falls in they should just pay if the risk does fall in. Uh, I've always been somewhat suspicious of the logic of that, uh, and I've been somewhat suspicious as to whether contractors uh, price a risk in quite the way in which the assumption is made. Uh, my experience of seeing uh, tender closure um, meeting minutes uh, when uh, there's a dispute over some matter of tender uh, would show that it's a much more rough and ready uh, risk assessment which is done at the end. But anyway, the concept is there. In standard forms, uh, strictly uh, putting in 
uh, the uh, unforeseen uh, conditions. Now, there are various civil law provisions uh, which may uh, grant, by way of the law, uh, the same sort of relief, even if there aren't standard uh, conditions. Uh, but those really go to the question of impossibility. So that as for a, an example in Article 188 of the Qatari Civil Code, in contracts that are binding on both sides, if the execution of the obligation of one of the parties of the contract becomes impossible for some external reason in which he played no part, this obligation terminates and the obligations uh, then which correspond terminate uh, and the contract is annulled. Therefore, if you leave to impossibility, that may enable a party to terminate uh, the contract. Uh, impossibility, of course, uh, as I know at least one person in this room uh, is familiar with, uh, was the route uh, in Hong Kong uh, when they took out uh, Clause 12, but left in that wonderful phrase that the contractor only had to carry out and complete the works insofar as legally and physically impossible, the argument was that it became physically and in one case legally impossible to complete the works uh, because of the unforeseen uh, conditions which arose, which then uh, meant in order to keep the contract alive, uh, the uh, engineer had to give an instruction to overcome the impossibility. And that may well be the same route uh, by which one would uh, impose uh, an article such as 188 of the Qatari Civil uh, Code. But also there's a provision in, in Article 402 of that code, which is uh, if it becomes impossible uh, and uh, if the uh, debtor doesn't execute the obligation in kind or delays in executing it, he's obliged to pay compensation for the detriment sustained by the creditor unless he proves that failure to execute or delay in execution was for an external cause in which he played no part. And if a person proves that the detriment has arisen from an external cause in which he played no part, such as force majeure or unexpected event, or fault on the part of a person harmed, or fault of a third party, he's not bound to pay compensation unless there's a provision that rules otherwise. So the other side of it is uh, that the client uh, doesn't have to pay compensation in those circumstances unless there is a rule uh, otherwise. Now there's a further provision uh, of uh, civil codes, in particular in the Egyptian civil code, which is followed in a number of the Middle Eastern countries, that if the economic equilibrium between the obligations of the employer and the contractor uh, collapse due to exceptional events of a general character which were not taken into consideration at the time of contracting and consequently the basis on which the financial valuation of the contract for works was made false, the judge or the arbitrator may rule in favour of increasing the contractor's fee or the alternative relief is terminating the contract. Uh, in France, uh, the, there's a concept of bouleversement, uh, where the works are radically different from those originally agreed. If the scope has changed, uh, then there's an ability uh, to have further uh, payment. Uh, and I recall that that uh, came uh, of age in the Channel Tunnel dispute. Uh, you will recall, perhaps, uh, that because England and France can never really agree about anything, uh, that when they came to put the contract together, and I think there may be somebody here who was involved in that, uh, they decided uh, that they, uh, English obviously wanted English law, the French wanted French law, so they decided that they would have common principles of English and French law, but where there weren't common principles in English and French law, it was international commercial law. 
uh, a more uncertain uh, version you couldn't uh, imagine. Uh, but on one particular claim, uh, bouleversement was the French part. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, there isn't an English uh, uh, part based on either the Egyptian civil code or the French civil code, which allows you to throw up a contract if it becomes economically uh, unviable for you. And therefore, one was left with these rather uncertain international uh, commercial uh, law to be applied in that case. So one sees that although there aren't unforeseen condition clauses, the civil code has a way of saying that if it's impossible or if the cost is very large, there may be a way of, of obtaining uh, relief so that that modifies what in common law would be all the risks uh, fall upon the contractor. Now, one of the next parts is interest. And, of course, uh, that is a part where uh, a particular provision, which in many English, uh, British forms of contract, particularly the civil forms of contract, there is a provision uh, for interest. Uh, and uh, as those who uh, deal with contracts abroad find, often at the end of an arbitration, uh, interest is of a great deal of importance in terms of the value of, of the award. Uh, and it is often said, well, uh, where Sharia law applies and the civil codes uh, of a lot of uh, both North African and Middle Eastern countries are based on Sharia law, you have the concept of riba or usury, uh, which is... Uh, uh, anathema to uh, Islamic law and prevents the recovery of interest. There are countries such as Saudi Arabia and the Sudan where that applies. But in fact, in many countries, uh, the impact of that Sharia law is limited uh, because uh, for various good reasons, uh, they've decided that there should be a provision uh, in the civil codes or the commercial codes which allows the recovery of uh, interest. So that for instance in uh, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Egypt, all the places which use derivatives of the Egyptian civil code, uh, if the obligation is uh, payment of money, uh, the amount of which is known at the time of filing a claim, there is an obligation to pay interest. Uh, there isn't uh, compound interest, uh, but the uh, feeling which is uh, generally there is in the Middle East you won't be able to obtain any interest on the debt. Uh, perhaps the limitation is that very often it's from the filing of the case in the arbitration, uh, but there are provisions for doing that. Let's look at the next point, which is liquidated damages. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, this is a case where the uh, Supreme Court has, certainly in the question of an £85 penalty notice, uh, recently uh, given us uh, the full benefit of their learning, uh, but uh, adopting, luckily, uh, the old rules which we've known and loved. Uh, in terms of penalty clauses. Uh, and if you look at liquidated damages, uh, obviously uh, they're incorporated so as to uh, give certainty as to the damages which would be paid if there was a delay. Uh, the concept of penalty came in, uh, obviously, to try and put a lid on the liquidated damages if there was something unconscionable uh, or uh, completely out of all proportion in the sum uh, which uh, had been allowed. English law wasn't a genuine pre-estimate of loss. Now, uh, the typical uh, liquidated damages clauses uh, provide simply uh, that liquidated damages are applicable. Uh, one of the uh, 
uh, areas uh, where uh, Middle Eastern law differs uh, and civil law uh, differs in a number of other countries, including China, is that uh, where you have a liquidated damages regime, then the court, or if you're in arbitration, the arbitrator, has the ability to decrease or increase the amount of liquidated damages to reflect the actual loss suffered. And therefore, if you have a liquidated damages clause in uh, a standard form uh, within civil law jurisdictions, uh, quite a number of them have provisions which allow the sum to be increased or reduced. It's a high threshold, uh, but uh, in many cases, as one knows, uh, in the end, either the liquidated damages are overwhelmingly larger than you can see that the client suffered, or on the other hand, uh, they go the other way uh, and they are much less than the damage suffered. And either way, uh, that liquidated damages can be um, set aside and adjusted. And indeed, there's a case in the UAE where the court decided that the contractually agreed rate of liquidated damages was grossly exaggerated compared to the damage suffered by the party uh, imposing liquidated damages. And therefore, although uh, the word penalty doesn't appear there, there is an adjustment of liquidated damages method by which, uh, which will apply in those countries. Interestingly enough, uh, the standard amendment to standard forms of contract in parts of the Middle East is to call them penalty damages, not liquidated damages, uh, because the word penalty then brings you into a different part of the civil code, uh, and the general uh, feeling of local lawyers is that that part of the civil code allows you to specify a sum which will be paid as a penalty, whereas once you have liquidated damages, there is a concept that they have to relate to the damages that you've suffered. So interesting, in England, the last thing you'd advise is to put the word penalty instead of liquidated damages, uh, but when you're uh, out of the jurisdiction, it's important to do so. Termination. Uh, termination uh, clauses, as we know, are common uh, in uh, construction contracts. Uh, and one of the big debates overseas is the ability uh, of a party unilaterally to terminate a contract. Uh, although there are provisions which say in a lot of the civil codes that you can terminate by mutual consent or by uh, court order or by force of law, the mutual consent is taken to be an agreement when the facts happen to terminate the agreement rather than a termination clause in the contract. And in a number of jurisdictions, a party who wishes to terminate a contract will apply to the court to have a court order to terminate the contract rather than relying on the pure unilateral termination uh, provision. Uh, and uh, the only uh, way around it, which is suggested by some drafts uh, persons, it is to say, uh, insert wording, to say that any termination of the contract under the express clauses is deemed to be exercised within the meaning of mutual consent as contemplated by Article Blank of the Civil Code. Uh, but otherwise, the court uh, will generally uh, consider that mutual consent has to be a termination by mutual consent, uh, which is entered into uh, at the time when the parties want to terminate. Now, limitation of liability clauses uh, is another uh, aspect. And in many 
parts of the Middle East, there are uh, decennial uh, responsibilities so that both the contractor and the supervising architect or engineer are liable for 10 years and that liability is without limit so that it is impossible either to exclude that liability or limit uh, the liability. And because it isn't just if a building collapses, the liability is joint and several between both the contractor and the supervising architect and engineer. Uh, and one can see that traditionally uh, limits of liability have been a way uh, to avoid uh, very large loss, uh, but both for consultant contracts and for contractors' contracts, uh, the effect is uh, uh, very uh, serious if there is a collapse and you have a limited liability, which may in turn reflect uh, the limit of insurance which you've taken out. Now, many let, let's look at some dispute resolution. Methods. Conciliation and mediation is very often uh, incorporated into the contract and of course conciliation is mediation uh, with the conciliator giving uh, a recommendation as to how the matter can be uh, uh, resolved. Culturally I think in the UK we have no difficulty uh, with mediation either for public or private uh, organisations. In many foreign jurisdictions, uh, there are a number of concerns uh, about uh, mediation or conciliation. That is, a person trying to assist the two parties uh, to negotiate. Uh, one of the particular reasons is obviously within public authorities, which is uh, very often uh, the bearer ultimately of the cost, there is a marked reluctance, there certainly can be here, uh, for anybody to uh, have the authority to enter into an agreement. But more importantly, that is very often linked to a culture uh, where one has to uh, be aware uh, of corruption within uh, many countries uh, and that leads to a particular person who might otherwise have authority not wanting to be seen to be the person who negotiates the settlement because of a fear that at some stage someone will say, well, that was a bad settlement. There must have been some form of corruption in the background which led to that person settling on those terms in order that they took a benefit. And a number of uh, public authorities are reluctant to go into mediation uh, for that very reason. Once they have a decision from somebody, uh, that is better. Sometimes the recommendation of, the media, of a conciliator will be seen as a more acceptable way of settling it. Uh, one or two have suggested, and there's a, certainly a well-known uh, mediator who will provide a certificate when the parties settle it to say that this has been a fair and reasonable settlement of the disputes between the party. Uh, but there, then and again, uh, I don't think the per professional liability insurance would cover that as a certificate. So that's a concern culturally uh, of the mediation and conciliation clauses in various parts of the world. Then adjudication and DABs. Uh, adjudication or security of payments is now spreading like a, I won't call it a disease, but is spreading like wildfire uh, around the world. Uh, and each jurisdiction, of course, has different uh, provisions. Uh, and one of the problems is that an adjudication provision has to be geared to the local uh, security of payment legislation. One might have thought that once you started with the 
the, the mother of adjudication in section 108 of the Housing Grants Act, everybody else would follow, but every single jurisdiction has investigated in detail and come up with a different solution. So if you have an adjudication provision, do not assume that that is enforceable. You will have security of payment legislation, which, for instance, may require you to refer a dispute to adjudication within 28 days of the dispute arising, rather than the more liberal at any time that we have in our adjudication. The second point is that obviously when you go abroad, and DABs have found this in Singapore, uh, you shouldn't assume that it's easy to enforce the decision of a DAB. In other words, when an adjudicator's decision is made by a DAB, where there's an arbitration clause, what do you do? Uh, and the solution was not to go straight to the court, uh, and use what uh, Mr. Justice Dyson used as the ruse that you couldn't both approbate and reprobate and therefore you couldn't go to arbitration if you were saying there wasn't a valid decision to be enforced. Uh, but uh, in other jurisdictions, people have gone to arbitration uh, to enforce the DAB decision and have then found that the other side have said, well, what we want is open up, review and revise that whole decision. Uh, the um, arbitrators have made an interim award, which in fact is a provisional award, uh, but is it an interim award saying, have this money on account until we resolve the whole thing? And the courts have then found a conundrum as to whether they can enforce an interim provisional award or not. Uh, and in many cases, that has led uh, to difficulties of enforcement. So what one has to have, if you have an adjudication provision, it is a local court uh, which is geared up uh, to enforcement. Uh, now, the uh, next uh, question, then, is how do you have a final resolution? Uh, and most uh, contracts will have arbitration uh, as the final resolution. Uh, this is where I have to make a, a uh, what I would describe as the little um, caption on the top of the evening standard uh, which says this is an advertised as announcement. Uh, there are now around the world increasingly replacement of adjudication clause of uh, arbitration clauses in uh, contracts by going to international courts. Uh, many people will be aware of the Dubai International Financial Centre Court, there's obviously the Qatar Court, and now there is the Abu Dhabi Global Markets Court, uh, and there are a number of others which are coming on stream. Uh, equally now there is one, uh, as you might have heard, in Singapore. Uh, and increasingly, uh, there is, uh, interesting inter internationally, uh, a wish to move away from arbitration. Uh, I don't know whether people here have been following uh, the European Union view uh, on investment treaty or other treaty obligations where they're now moving from arbitration uh, to having courts. Of course, the good news for somebody like me is, as a retired judge, you have some uh, career that you can go to afterwards. Uh, but uh, there are a number of uh, advantages and disadvantages, and I think the experience over the years uh, here has been that arbitration clauses are being missed out of, of a lot of standard forms. I think when you go abroad, the question is, should there be an arbitration clause there? Because if you don't have that, you will be in the local courts. And that is obviously seen uh, to be undesirable for most uh, international cases. Uh, therefore, uh, the choice is really between international uh, or uh, international arbitration or the courts. So I think one can see uh, from this review of provisions uh, of standard forms 
uh, that the one thing one needs to be aware of is that there are differences in the legal system that may lead to different approaches to the way in which you treat uh, contractual terms. But I think uh, the experience of uh, international arbitrators, and I see a number of them uh, sitting here, is that in the end, uh, using an English standard form has now become the norm, uh, an English language standard form, derived from the common law, uh, has become uh, the norm uh, throughout many parts of the world. That is partly, of course, because the language of the contract or the language of communication on most construction contracts is English. Uh, however, one has to be aware uh, that where that applies, uh, there is very often uh, a need uh, to consider how the provisions of the contract, uh, which many of us have known and loved, uh, are interpreted and dealt with internationally. So certainly the answer is the uh, UK standard forms of contract can be applied internationally, uh, but you have to be careful about cultural and local law aspects. As Isam al-Tamimi, uh, the well-known lawyer in Dubai, said in his book, uh, which is a practical guide to litigation and arbitration in the UAE, uh, because of the nature of Dubai, in particular as a commercial center, and because of the presence of international law firms with common law roots, many contracts which have been drafted in the UAE appear to have been influenced by common law principles. He comments, this has created difficulties in the application of the law to these contracts by the courts of the UAE since judicial authority does not recognize some of the principles or practices of the common law system. I think that's a well taken point, but I think the conclusion is uh, that in fact they don't recognize the principles and practices, but probably they reflect the local principles and practices uh, better than Mr. Tamimi thinks. Thank you very much. very much Sir Vivian. Um, you will remember that this is the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, um, without which we might well have been a civil code country. Um, and a lot of other things would have been different too, but since that's one of those turning points in history, we have this cultural difference that persists and persists. So who's going to start off the questioning. We have microphones and uh, please use them if you're going to speak. Yes, Jonathan. Yes, please. And say who you are. I know who you are, but that's all. this is all going to be on the website, by the way, JCT website, um, in a couple of days. Really enjoyed your talk very much. Um, the question is this. Um, Given that uh, the differences are more uh, imaginary, perhaps, uh, as I understood you to be saying, is your prediction, if you look into the future, I mean, Richard Saxon's very interested in the future of things, if you looked into the future, are we going to get closer, or are those uh, boundaries going to remain between, say, common law and uh, civil law jurisdictions and how they deal with the concepts we, that you've uh, outlined to me? Well, I, th I think one of the interesting things is looking at this question of interest in the Middle East, uh, because um, Sharia law obviously uh, applies to a number of jurisdictions. And uh, I think one of the interesting uh, approaches was when they brought in the provision of the civil code in Egypt to allow interest for civil and commercial matters, 
there was a challenge to the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court in civil law jurisdictions, looking at those sorts of matters, uh, on the basis that it didn't comply with the Constitution. Um, and I should say the, the Civil Code had that provision. They've then brought in Sharia as part of the Constitution at a later date. Uh, and the, uh, it went before the Constitutional Court, and they held that it didn't have retrospective effect, the Sharia introduction, and therefore they could keep the interest provision. Uh, that was widely criticised as not being a justifiable decision, because once you have Sharia, it should look, or Sharia law, you should look at the obligations. But interestingly, when it came to all the other uh, jurisdictions, um, there was a feeling that they had to move into the more common law area because commerce is important. And therefore, you find that within the civil code countries where Sharia law applies, they are now finding reasons mainly linked to compensation where a party uh, doesn't pay. And dare I say, one of the re parts of reasoning is if you have an obligation to pay and the person does not pay on time, then that is a breach of the obligation of good faith and there should be compensation for that breach of that important obligation. And where do you get an interest? So I think that that's an example of how once you have a commercial uh, Western organisation, uh, you tend then to have to have a more common law approach and in, uh, impute into the civil code certain of the common law uh, decisions. Uh, the comment, I think, by Assam El-Tamimi is, is really saying uh, here I am with a local Dubai firm, and it's all these international law firms who are coming in and stealing uh, the limelight using common law principles. But I think that is very much spreading throughout the world, and indeed you see it in China that they now have introduced a construction law, they've introduced various other provisions which are bringing common law principles as part of the civil code. Yes. Uh, we've been checked. Uh, I have a question that perhaps built on the last one um, concerning clauses excluding liability for consequential loss and indirect loss. Uh, I know of at least one case where Dutch law is the governing law, and like many systems around the world, they, they don't identify with the terms consequential loss or yeah. indirect loss, despite it being used in FedEx forms. I was wondering whether you have any thoughts or experiences uh, on that, because it strikes me that that is an example where actually English law ends up trumping, even if there's a different governing law. Well, well, certainly you're right. There are a number of concepts uh, where, um, if you use an English law provision, uh, it creates difficulties in terms of where you fit that within the civil law, civil code provision, because. As we know, consequential is a, um, a word perhaps which derives from Hadley and Baxendale. Uh, and one of the interesting uh, questions is then, if you're dealing with that, you have to look to English law in order to interpret a phrase uh, because it's a foreign phrase to uh, the local law. So um, that's a, a good example of that. Uh, I remember some years ago um, a, a, another example. Saudi Arabia uh, client terminated. Uh, they were then uh, taken off the tender list and lost a lot of income. Uh, and as a result, in the arbitration where we held they were wrongly terminated, uh, they brought a claim for damages for um, the... Uh, fact that the tender board had taken them off the list. Uh, and the difficulty was, how did they get this in 
uh, Saudi Arabian law. And we had two very well-known Saudi Arabian law professors who came. Uh, and we had uh, quotes from the Quran about where you make a statement and that leads to the right to um, defamation damages. Uh, and it's the calling somebody a donkey and so on is, is, the, is the position under the Quran. And what was interesting is that both of the Saudi Arabian law experts said, uh, what would be the position under English law? Because in commercial matters, uh, they were more likely to follow a principle of uh, English commercial law rather than something of Sharia law which was derived from it. And I think that, that shows that although um, it's a completely separate system, very often uh, because uh, a number of uh, civil codes are not well developed. Uh, they look to the principles of English commercial law to know what particular phrases mean. And I should say, I, I don't think there's anybody in, in the arbitration, is there? Anyone in my arbitration today? No. Uh, the American lawyers in my arbitration uh, decided that the points on Saudi Arabian law were so difficult that they then entered into agreement they should apply English law. <laughs> Gosh, poor Britannia. <laughs> um, any, any more questions, or shall we t turn informal and add some alcohol? <laughs> is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a question. <laughs> um, so Vivian, uh, there's no doubt that you've been everywhere and touched all these issues uh, as they have been developing, as, as globalization has advanced. And I think it's quite fascinating that uh, the soft power of the United Kingdom way of doing things is still evident and may even be growing. And uh, so thank you for your insight. And as you said about the top of the evening standard, uh, we know where to come. Uh, so I hope you will all thank Sir Vivian in the usual way and then join us for more informal discussion outside.